soldiers? How many soldiers cast lots for Jesus' coat? On your mark, get set, go! Go, go, go! How many soldiers cast lots for Jesus' coat? John 19, verse 23 and 24. yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. This is These words are not in your, your song or your, your handbook, but uh, I think a lot of you guys know this chorus. And definitely a good chorus for um, teen camp for all your life. I'm going to start out, I'm going to, you guys echo me. Echo me. And then I'll, when I point to you, you sing. When I point to myself, I sing back and forth. Let's help me out. Ready? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up higher and higher, and He shall lift you up. Good, sing your best, do your best. Focus here, ready? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Preaching, you want to 
have a successful life when you humble yourself. Amen. Think about the words. I want to say one more time. Would you think about those words? And I just make this sound pretty. Say it to the Lord. Think about what God is doing in your heart. One more time, fellas. Lead. Ready? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He shall lift you up higher and higher, and He shall lift you up. Listen to the preacher. That's how Valley Baptist is going to see. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's special. Valley Baptist, come on. <laughs>
came to preach uh, one of the night sessions anyway. Um, there's there's a one, two, three, four pastors in here. And uh, anyway, and there's you, and you're ugly. So, um, not, you girl, not you girls, not you girls. Well, some of you girls. Uh, okay. uh, I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. There's no such thing as an ugly girl. It's okay to lie when you're talking like that, okay? It's okay. It's like I said, there's no such thing as a fat lady. No such thing. You can't say that to an adult crowd because they get offended. And um, anyway, um, fluffy, yes. No fat, okay, so you can say. Uh, um, no, actually, actually, um, there is a, there is something that, uh, Young ladies don't understand, a lot of the older ladies don't either, but there are no older ladies either, I should, I should rephrase that. Um, mature ladies. Uh, beauty doesn't have much to do with your looks. It doesn't. It has to do with your spirit. Uh, I say, there's been plenty of uh, very, what the world would say is attractive, beautiful ladies who are despised by their husbands because they are ugly on the inside. And I said, girls, I know you want to be beautiful and make yourself up and all that, but if you focus on a, on a sweet spirit, uh, it'll, it'll do you wonders. It really will. And uh, if you get a guy that only cares about what's on the outside, um, well, it's not going to last. It won't once you girls realize that. And uh, when the outside goes away, what's on the inside lasts for the forever. And if you pick a good one, guys, you got a good one. You pick a bad one, well, I'm sorry. And uh, anyway, but girls, don't 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 get discouraged with things because you, you it doesn't matter that that uh, that that volcano right in the middle of your forehead it will soon pass away and uh, it will go. And uh, actually, I haven't seen any of you girls with uh, with uh, volcanoes on your forehead. Uh, some of you guys maybe, I don't know, but uh, that's okay. Turn your, turn your, turn your Bible to the book of Esther. Esther. And uh, I, am, I am very, very nervous up here with this. And, um, and I had my message already for Friday morning. That's a brief, short uh, punch in the nose to give you one last chance to make a decision. And then um, uh, Pastor Valdez, as he preaches tonight, and uh, he's the one who's going to make it up to take care of his father, um, who's... Uh, very much need in need of assisted uh, assistance all the time, and so we couldn't make it up. And I got a sign tonight. And I said, "Thank you, preacher. I appreciate it." And uh, so anyway, that, that I had to come up with a whole other sermon, and that's that's only one sermon a year. That's all I can do. And I got to do two. And uh, but anyway, I want to go over this with you. Esther chapter two. Esther chapter two. We're going to start there, and I'm going to show you. I'm going to read a verse for you here. And uh, we're going to turn to several different passages, and I may just quote some for you. But I want you to—I want you to pay attention. I want you to pay attention. Let's keep your keep your Bible open to Esther chapter two. I'm going to read from Esther chapter four. We're going to pray, and then we'll be right there where you're at. Esther chapter four and verse fourteen: For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement. And deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? And young people, there's a time coming for you. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. But every single young person in this room has a job that God is preparing them to do. That's right. You might hear it called the will of God. You might hear it called God's plan for your life. But there is a time and a job that God has for you to do. We're going to talk just a little bit about that tonight. Keep your finger in Esther chapter 2. Let's pray. Father, pray, pray to be with me tonight. I pray you get me out of the way and that uh, your word would, would have a clear passage to the ears of these young people in this room. There's pastors in this room. 
There's youth pastors in this room. There's youth workers. There's college students. And there's teenagers. And, and then there's me. And God, I want all of us to be helped. And so would you please work through me in some miraculous way and allow this message to make a difference in our hearts. In your name I pray. Amen. Esther chapter 2, verse number 10. Hold your finger there. Esther was a young girl. She lived in Israel. She had a life like many of you have. She had a mother, mother and father. She might have had siblings. I'm sure she had friends. She lived in a house. She probably had some land, unless she lived in the city. But she went about her daily business like many of you do. She went to school. She learned. She studied. She worked. She helped around the house. She had a normal family. She probably had the same troubles a lot of you have. She probably had the same difficulties a lot of you have. And one day, an enemy king from Babylon comes along from Assyria, from the north, and comes and knocks at their door. They come with spears, with bows, with swords, with fire, with battering rams. They come with machines of war, and they are very soon captured. Her parents are killed right in front of her. Her siblings are not mentioned. She was taken captive. As the enemy soldiers are leading this young girl out of the city with many others, she's walking by the bodies of her friends and neighbors. Maybe she's walking along and sees siblings laying on the side of the road. She gets taken from her home to a place hundreds of miles away to a culture she does not know, to a language she does not know. And along the way, she sees her cousin Mordecai. He's older, like an uncle to her. He sees her. Can you imagine the relief? The relief in her heart to find someone, someone older, someone she knew, someone she could trust, someone that could care for her. And he takes her and adopts her, raises her up as, one, as a daughter. And they find a place they are in this kingdom. Years pass. Esther is now a young lady, and all along the way, she's been there with Mordecai to help. A decree goes out from the king because he'd gotten rid of his wife for her actions of disobedience, and uh, her actions are probably what that queen Vashti should have done in this case, but she had got, he had gotten rid of her, said, you're no longer the queen. And a little while later, he said, I need to find a new queen. I want you to bring me all the virgins of Israel, all the ones that are most beautiful. I want you to go out and I want you to find them. I want you to find all the virgins of the area. It doesn't matter where they're from, uh, what, they, what, what nationality they are. I want you to go and find all of them. And they gather all these young ladies up, and Esther is one of those young ladies. Soldiers once again come knocking at their door. Say, hey, we have a reputation. You were pointed out, and you've been chosen to audition to be the next queen of the country. A lot of people think, oh, that would be so amazing. Not in this case. Not in this case. You get a young girl who's raised godly. She's being brought into a wicked king, a godless king, to be his wife. Why? Why? Why would God let, let such, such drastic things happen in a young lady's life? See Mordecai saying, look, Esther, this is the way things are. This is the way life is. And if you just go, if you do what's right, and you do what I've taught you, and you listen to me, everything will be okay. And he goes on and he helps her. And she gets brought with all these other girls and they are prepared and they're, they go through all these ritualistic cleansing and beautifying and nails painted and hair done and oil baths and perfume baths. And they want to make sure they're the most beautiful that they can be. And she goes along and little by little, she gets chosen by the king as the number one contestant to be queen. Now we're going to look at a few verses here along the way. The story is still not a good one, but not horrible. Not horrible. But I want to point out some things about Esther that might help you. And there, there's bugs flying around. I know some of you have difficulty. It's just one of those striped eyelash bugs that they're not intense. Uh, but they won't hurt you. They really won't. And uh, so it's just a demonic spirit flying around trying to distract you there. And uh, so if it comes a little closer, um, Matthew, eat it, okay? 
And, uh, anyway, let's get that thing out of here. I pray that it lands, okay? Um, let's close those doors. Let's close those doors. We close the doors. We got all the windows open, and let's close those back doors here. We're not going to be long, and uh, we can suffer for a while, and uh, we'll go on through. While we're doing, let me tell the rest of the story, and then we'll go look at verses. Esther, Esther gets chosen to be queen, and through many ordeals and situations, uh, Esther finds out from her uncle, so to speak, Mordecai, that Haman, who hates the Jews, has convinced the king to let him eliminate the entire Jewish population there in that country. And the reason he doesn't like the Jews, because as he's riding through town, everybody's bowing to him, and Mordecai's standing there, I'm not bowing to you. Makes so mad, he's so mad. Mordecai wouldn't bow. He said, I know, I'm going to, well, he's, he's a Jew, we're going to get rid of all the Jews, get rid of all the Hebrews. So he goes to the king, gets the king's permission to do so. The king's like, I trust Haman, he's got good judgment, these people must be horrible people, let's get rid of them. Not only that, Haman says he'll pay for it. Oh, hey, go ahead, you're going to pay for it. So Haman, he makes all these plans, he's going to hang Mordecai on these giant gallows, he's going to destroy all the Jewish people in the area. And uh, Mordecai sends a message to Esther, he said, Esther, you've got to do something. You are the only one in the position, in a position to do anything about this. You got to go talk to the king. And Esther says, you don't understand, Mordecai. I can't just go talk to the king. He's in his normal duties and normal business, and I haven't seen him for over a month. He hasn't called for me to come see him. And if I go to see him without being called, I, I will be put to death. And that's where Mordecai says, Esther, you're not going to escape this just because you live in the palace. And if you don't do it, somebody else is going to do it. But there's a rescue that needs to happen here. There's a duty that needs to happen here. And God has prepared you for this. For such a time as this, God says in his word, that Mordecai tells Esther, God has prepared you for this. God wants you to do this. God has designed all your life situations, all the difficulties, all the death, all the loss. God has used all that to get you to this point where you're going to stand before the king and you are the one who's able to do something about your people. You're the one who's able to do something about your family. You're the one who's able to do something to deliver us from this horrible, atrocious crime that's about to be committed. And Esther says these famous words, famous words, if I perish, I perish. And she decides to go into the king. And as she walks in, you can see the guards because of the interruption, maybe pull their swords, ready to strike down whoever dare interrupt the king. And the king looks up as he hears the commotion, and he sees Esther, and he holds out that scepter. His eyes light up, and he says, Whoa, I'm so glad to see you. And she comes in, and everything worked out. She invites the king to dinner, and men love food, amen, so just get him food. Amen. Invites the king to dinner. The story works out. Haman is hung on the gallows. The Israel, Israelites, a plan is worked out where they can defend themselves. They are delivered. The bad people die. Happily ever after, everybody lives. Yeah. But young people, for you, there's, there's going to be such a time as this in your life. That's right. And for some reason, teenagers, even teenagers with a heart for God, think when that time comes, then I will begin to do what God wants me to do. When that time comes, of course, I'll do what God wants me to do. But let me tell you something about Esther. Esther's journey, Esther's accomplishment, Esther's victory in this case did not begin as she entered into the throne room. It didn't begin when she went to see the king. It didn't begin as the soldier's swords came out. It didn't begin as the king held his scepter out. It's not where it began. Let me show you where it began. Turn over to Esther chapter 2. You should be there already. Esther chapter 2 and verse number 10. It says, Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred who she was, that she was a Jew. Esther had not showed her people nor her kindred that she was a Jew. For Mordecai had what? Charged her that she should not show it. Do you know where Esther's journey began? Do you know where her success began? Do you know where her accomplishments began? Do you know where victory for her entire people began? Do you know where the rescue began? It began with her surrendering to an advisor's will. It 
it began with her surrendering to a leader's directions. It began with her surrendering to a parent's figure's instructions in life. That's where it began. And it didn't just begin there. We'll see in the next verse here. Turn over to page number, turn over to the next page. Turn to the next page. She gets brought in to where all the girls are being prepared. And when it was their time to go meet the king and go introduce themselves to the king, they had all these treasures and all this jewelry that they could choose from. And in verse number 15, it says in chapter 2, verse 15, Now when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Ab Abihel, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. Not only did she listen to her father figure, Mordecai, but she listened to the wise advisor that was there to help prepare her to meet the king. Now, she could have chosen whatever was around her. She could have chosen to dress herself up, to take all the beautiful riches, to make her look splend splendid, to make her look very attractive. And she went to uh, Haggai and said, Haggai, what do you suggest that I bring into the king? And once again, you see Esther, a young girl, a young lady, going to somebody who knew what to do and said, what should I do? Once again, she surrendered her will for the will of an advisor. Let's go down a few verses to verse number 20. Continues. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her. For Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, look at this next phrase, like as when she was brought up with him. So it didn't just start with Esther and Mordecai at the palace. It didn't just start with Esther and Mordecai at the house. It started with Esther and Mordecai way back here when he first met her coming out of the city and adopted her as his daughter. It started at that moment that she had a father in her life where she decided from now on, I'm going to say yes, sir. And I'm going to look to the God-given authority in my life. And I'm going to let them make the decisions in my life that I need to make. And it didn't just do it as a child. It transitioned into the junior high years. Then it transitioned into the high school years. And it didn't just happen while she was under 18. She turns 18 and becomes a young lady. And even though she could go off and she could make her own decisions, she continued in the same faith, the same obedience that she had had. And she said, Mordecai, what do I do? And he told her what to do, and she did it. She said, hey, guy, what do I do? And he told her what to do, and he did, and she did it. What we see in Esther, she had a spirit of surrender. Many of you know Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, excuse me, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into the understanding. I'm thinking about teenagers, so many teenagers. Your mistakes that you make 10 years from now could be corrected the same way that Esther's mistakes were avoided when she was a child. Right, right. Amen. You read the book of Proverbs, and the theme to the whole book of Proverbs is children listen, children hear, children, would you be wise? Wisdom lifts up her voice and says, Please, whoever will listen, will you please give me your ear? But we have young people all across the world, Christian young people who are saved young people, who go to youth department every week, who go to church every week, who may have a Christian home, who might ride on a bus whose parents are unsaved, who might have parents who don't care about church, but Christian young people who claim the name of Christ, who think that they know better than the people that God has put in their life. Right. Yeah. You go to Esther's end where she goes before the king and all the way through you have Esther as a young person surrendering her will. You have Esther as a junior high age surrendering her will. You have Esther as a high schooler surrendering her will. You have Esther as a young lady surrendering her will. And she gets all the way up to the king and the king because of her spirit of surrender God was able to say to her Esther I want you to risk everything, everything that you have to save your people. And Esther said, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if I'm going to die. I don't know if I'm going to lose everything that I have. 
but I'm going to do what I've always done. When my uncle Mordecai asked me to do something, I did it. When he asked me to do something as a teenager, I did it. When hey, I suggested I do something, I did it. And now when God suggests I do something, I'm just going to go ahead and keep on doing what I've been taught to do. Amen. Amen. Yep. Wonder what would have happened if Esther would have gotten to the throne room and she hadn't surrendered and she hadn't surrendered and she'd lived in rebellion and she'd lived self-willed and she'd lived doing her own thing and she'd become 18 and say, I'm going to do my own thing and I don't need to do all the things my parents tell me and I don't need to listen to my pastor anymore. I don't listen to my youth pastor anymore. I don't need to listen to my Sunday school teachers anymore. I don't need to listen to the people around me anymore because I'm a big girl now and I'm going to do my own thing in life. She walks into the king's palace. Do you think she's going to walk in uninvited to the king's throne room? No, because she was a rebel growing up, and she's going to continue to be a rebel going on. That's right. Mm -hmm. Your success as a Christian in the future is determined by what you choose to do tonight. Amen. It doesn't start next year. It doesn't start when you turn 15. It doesn't start when you become an adult. It doesn't start when you have children. It doesn't start when you have a family. It doesn't start when you have grandkids. It doesn't start when you get older. It doesn't start when you get a job. Your success in whatever you do begins tonight when you leave this room and you decide what you're going to do. You're going to do it your way. You're going to do your will. You're going to live self-willed. You're going to do the things that you know what's right. Amen. Esther started out yielding to Mordecai. Proverbs 10, 17 says, He that refuses to reprove Ereth. Esther wasn't going to do that. She said, no way. I'm not going to trust my own opinion. I'm not going to trust my own wisdom. I'm just a girl. I'm just a young, young girl. I've lost my family. I've lost everything that I have, and I can't do anything on my own. I need to trust in the people that God has given me, and she yielded. She yielded to the Chamberlain. It's a new place, different customs. She had no idea what the king would expect. And once again, she decided not to trust in her own understanding, but to trust in the Chamberlain. The Bible tells us that she continued in the commandments of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. Just because she was grown, she didn't stop. Take your, take your Bible again, turn over to Esther chapter 4. Verse 8 tells us that fateful day. Also, he, Mordecai, gave him, the messenger, the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them. And showed it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make request before him for her people. And then look at verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know and this will over, whether man or woman shall come to the king into the inner court who is not called. There is one law of his, the king's, to put him to death. See, God's going to come along to you with something that's more than just disobedience or obedience. He's going to come along to you with something he wants you to do that's got a little bit greater risk to it. Some of you young people in here, God's calling you to preach. There's a little bit of risk to that, isn't there? God's calling you to be a missionary. That means packing up and leaving home and risking some things. God's calling you to take a stand in your youth group. But that's a risk you're going to have to take of losing some friends. Maybe looking the fool in the eyes of the people that are the cool crowd. Young people, God's calling you to something. God's calling you to stand before the king, so to speak. He's got a duty he's called you to do. He's got a responsibility that you don't even know about. Way back in the early teen years, Esther had no idea she was going to stand before King Ahasuerus. She didn't know what was coming down the road. 
And just like that, you have no idea what God's calling you to do. You don't know what God's plan is for you to do. You have no idea what God expects from you someday. That's why you've got to trust that God has put the people in your life that you need to have in your life. And you've got to decide how you're going to respond to the instruction that God has given you. You're going to have to decide how much you're going to yield of your own will to give to others and to yield to their will. You're going to have to decide all those things. Amen. There's going to come a time of fear. There's going to come a time of trouble. There's going to come a time where pain is, a, is the risk, where death might be the risk, where in, insecurities are, are causing fear in your life, where embarrassment is a very great possibility. But God's will is still God's will. God's will doesn't change because you're afraid. God's will doesn't change because you've got, uh, you've got difficulties in your life. God's will doesn't change because what you have, are supposed to do is hard. God has something for you to do. Now, young people, I cannot, I cannot begin to tell you if we had every good soul winning Baptist church, we had a youth group that gets their young people out telling people how to be saved and to get, their, get them to read their Bible and get them to go to church and get them to go to Sunday school and get them to grow in the Lord. If those youth groups, if those teenagers, just like you in this room, rose up and said, I'm going to do this one thing, is I'm going to say to God, God, I don't know what king I have to stand before someday, so to speak. I don't know what job you have for me in the future. I don't know what difficulties you have for me to face. I don't know what your will is in my life for the future, but I do know something, God. I do know you have a will for me tonight, and I know you have something for me tomorrow, and I know you have something for me the next day. I know what you want me to be on Sunday. I know where you want me to be on Sunday morning. I know what you want me to do tomorrow morning. I know the words you want me to say. I know the words you don't want me to say. And so, God, until you show me your will, I'm going to go ahead and yield my will. I'm going to yield my way. I'm going to surrender my will to the things that I know you want me to do. Amen. Let me ask you, teenager, God's got something for you. There's an ahas of hers you're going to have to stand before. There's a job that you're going to have to do. There's a world that needs rescued. There's a people that need rescued. There's people dropping into hell as we speak right now to burn forever in a fiery hell, except you are the one that can save them from it. If you decide, I will do what God wants me to do someday. By doing what God wills for me to do tonight. Yeah, it doesn't happen magically the day you get older. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of times, good Christian young people like you in here, you get this idea of, oh, yeah, when I get to Bible college, Maybe, maybe I'll get a little older. Maybe then I'll know a little better and I'll be a little braver. And maybe then I'll be able to do what God wants me to do. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. God's will starts today. Amen. Amen. Bible reading starts today. Prayer starts today. Going to church starts today. Authority, being obedient, yielding, surrendering starts today. Listening to your pastor starts today. It all starts with yielding your own way. But I'm afraid in America we have a bunch of selfish, spoiled, arrogant, mm -hmm. no better than everybody else teenagers. Yeah all across good churches who've been allowed to do whatever they want because they're good young people. They've never had to give up what they wanted. And that's why we don't have young men going to the ministry. That's why we don't have young ladies strong enough to handle being a help me to that man who's serving God. Me and my wife were talking about, Miss Ryan were talking with her about um, different parents. We've met some of you, if not parents on your bus routes. They can't handle their kids. It's too emotionally draining. 
the kids have therapists because the parents aren't strong enough to help the kids. Most of you have probably been in houses that are a wreck. Walk into a home that just smells because the trash is knocked over and it's been there for days. It's not clean. You know where that started? It started with selfish young people who never yielded. Because those selfish young people who never yielded becomes, become moms that will not give up what they want to do what their kids need. You know, I have so many split homes in the country, so many single moms and dads leaving, leaving the kids, leaving the family. Why? Because the dad was never taught to give up what he wanted for the sake of others. It's all yielding, young people. One of my greatest fears is that we have young people who say, I don't care. I just want to do what I want. It's Christians like that that God condemns a nation for. Young people, we got to We've got a country to save. If we had every single young man in here, it'd be awesome. Give their life to Christ and go out and preach the gospel. Listen up. Preach the gospel and win hundreds to Christ across our country. It would change our world. But how many are going to do it? I'll tell you how many are going to do it. The ones who tonight say, I'm going to do what God's will is for my life tonight. I'm going to follow the rules tonight. I'm going to listen tonight. When tomorrow comes, I'm going to be what I'm supposed to be as a Christian tomorrow. When I go home, I'm going to show my parents what a Christian young person is supposed to be when I get home. Yeah. When I go to church, I'm not just going to be a Sunday school attendee. I'm going to be a Christian at Sunday school. Yep. And it takes young people who say, I cared before and I still care a little bit, but I'm not going to let the people around me keep me from being what God wants me to be someday. Amen. Amen. Young people like Esther, you've got a task to do. I don't know what it is for you. I have no idea. Most of you have no idea. But are you willing to forfeit the blessings and the happiness and the joy of the future for the sake of self-will tonight? Let me ask young people, what's stopping you from doing what God wants you to do? That's the last question. What's stopping you from reading your Bible? What's stopping you from spending time in prayer? What's stopping you from going soul winning? What's stopping you from doing what your parents want you to do? What's stopping you from going to church? What's stopping you? Why don't you, why don't you ask God, God, what's stopping me? Why don't you, you know what's stopping you? The decision tonight that I would like every young person to do to make is to pinpoint what's stopping you. I think you're great young people. But the devil sees your weakness and the devil starts a blaze, just like an arson at the weak point. And he's going to feed your weakness. And he's going to try to keep you from doing the things that God wants you to do. See, person, what are you, what's, what's stopping you? Got to get your book out. Write it down. Write down what's stopping you. Go ahead. Do it. It's a weird invitation, but we're having an invitation right now. What's stopping you? Write it down. God's, God's touched, touched your heart in some area. What, what's stopping you from reading your Bible, young person? What is it? 
Write it out. Write it out plain right in front of you. Don't be ashamed of it. Make it clear. Make it clear. Write down uh, reading my Bible and right next to it put down what's stopping you from doing it. I don't know. All of you are different. I remember as a teenager I had trouble reading my Bible because I was reading so many other books. The Bible had little interest to me. And I'd read four, five, six books a week. I'm talking about big books. I'd read, I'd read, and then I'd, I'd, I'd oh man, the Holy Spirit would get at me. I knew I should be reading my Bible, and I, I would not choose the book instead of my Bible. He's convicting me. What is, what is it? Is it, is it? is it your games? Are you just playing games? Are you giving anything to God? Okay, what, what's stopping you from going so many young people? Right now, right now, ask yourself. Because we're, we're getting to the root of the, we're getting to the root cause right now. If we can't fix it today, we can't give you success tomorrow. So what's what's keeping you from going out? What's keeping you from, from following the invitation last night, the message of going and telling the people you have a burden for, you haven't told? What's keeping you from going to that neighbor? What's keeping you from going to that friend? What's keeping you from going to the people down the street? What's keeping you from all that? Right now, you, you know, you know it's what, what's keeping you from praying? So many young people haven't bent on your knee, gotten on your knees at your home and prayed by yourself at all. Not for a long, long time. Let me ask you, what's, what's stopping you? What's stopping you? Do you pray? I'm not talking about before meals. Do you pray? Do you get alone in your room and get on your knees by your bed and do you pray? Do you go to God in prayer? Just like so we, we have the prayer meeting out here before the preaching, do you pray? If you do, great. But if you don't, what's stopping you? Write it down. Figure it out. God, God pointed out to you. If you want to know, he'll point it out to you. Let me ask you, you some of you struggle with your parents. What, what's, what's keeping you from obeying your parents? Is it the influence of some bad friends? Is it somebody feeding rebellion in your heart? What is it? I don't know. You've got to answer those questions. God's got to tell you what the things are. You've got to identify the enemy and you've got to squash that thing before it takes hold in your life and destroys your possibilities in the future. Destroys God's will for your life in the future. And we don't want that to happen for you. To young people, let me ask you, what's, what's keeping you from church? You know, most of our churches have church three times a week. What, what, why aren't you there? Maybe some of your parents don't want you there. That's, that's okay. Honor your parents. But a lot of you have a choice. What's keeping you? Is it a ride? Well, we can fix that one. Uh, what, what's stopping you? Is it, is it really just you don't want to go? And that's okay. There's days I don't want to go to church. But why? Why don't you want to go? Are you looking forward to something else? Turn over to Romans chapter 6, 16. It's our last verse one here. So it goes a little bit with the split session this morning, this afternoon. Romans 6, 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. Now, young people, you've got a decision to make just like Esther. Not, none of you have a life compared to Esther. A lot of you have some difficulties in life. I understand that. And it hurt for a lot of you. But none of you have faced what Esther faced. Esther faced horrific tragedy in her life. She had to choose. Do I yield to self? Or do I yield to to God's will. Every day she had to decide. You yield yourself servant to self. It leads to sin. You will have death. That future spouse you have that's perfect for you, death. That great family someday that you're going to have, death. The great opportunities you have someday, the happiness, the joy, Death, all because you yield to self, but you yield yourself to righteousness, to be servants of righteousness, to yield to the will of God. Oh, I can't even begin to tell you the great things God has for you. You have no idea. So 
So what is it, young person? Not what's stopping you from entering the throne room. What's stopping you tonight? What's stopping you from doing God's will right now? And what are you going to do about it? Let's stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, bless. Let you bless the invitation. These young people listen so attentively. So grateful for them. And I want them so much to be able to see. Just to see the good. To see how wonderful you are. God, I pray that you'd help them to make decisions for right. They move in their hearts. With their heads bowed and their eyes closed. Tell me, say, Brother Josh, there's, there's things that I know are stopping me from doing the will of God today. And I don't want it to destroy my future. Would you slip a hand up so I can pray for you? Amen. Young people, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make it with God. You can't make it with anybody else. You've got to make that decision. You've got to make it stick. You've got to make it stand. You've got to identify. You've got to take care of the problem. And you've got to live daily surrendering to God's will. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, the instruments are going to play. If you need to come to an old-fashioned altar, make things right with God and get his help, come on down. Make room for people. If you don't have a place to go, you can stay in your seat and you're there. If you do have a place to go, go. Move, move, move. If you can't get up to the front, move to a different row. Move to a different seat. Leave your chairs. Maybe some of you, you just have a problem just listening and surrendering. That's okay. I think most of us have that problem as a young person. We want to see you get the victory over that. If you wrote something down that was the root cause, the thing that was keeping you from doing something that God wants you to do, be very honest with God right now. Be very honest with Him and tell Him why you're failing. Hey God, I'm, I'm failing in reading my Bible because I like my video games too much. Confess it. Just confess it. If it's a friend you have that's pulling you away from other decisions you make because they're a worldly friend, and you're gonna have to you're gonna have to get separation from that friend. Go to God with it. Tell him, tell him everything. He's the one person you can tell whatever you know you're struggling with, and he'll be there to help you. Some of you have multiple things. Bring them all to God. Lay them all down at the altar. Lay them all out before him, and let God be there to help you. If you can't get back to your seat, just stand where you're at, wait for people to finish praying. Don't be a distraction. We're talking right now. People are still praying. Take your time. such a desire. I wanted, I wanted you to use me. I wanted to be able to do great things for you, but I was, I was afraid. I was insecure. Didn't know what to do. Wasn't bold. Wasn't able to take a stand on things. And I remember seeing older teenagers and others with 
just a, a more easygoing personality, just so easy to get up and, and have fun and preach and sing and, and go soul winning and talk to people. God, I was never that way as a young person. Oh, my heart wanted it. I'm so grateful for you leading me in the way that I went. You allowed me to learn and to grow. They protected me from uh, all the filth that could have so easily been in my life. God, these young people, I think a lot of them are the same. I pray that you bless them. I pray that you'd help them. I pray you'd speak to their hearts. I pray you bless the night. Help us get some rest this evening. In your name I pray. Amen. Have a seat. It is now 9.23. If you made a decision, once again, write it down. Write it down. Keep this camp book. I suggest you write your name in the front of it. If you find somebody else's book, just come put it on the platform when you find it. And uh, so if you're missing a book, come look at the platform. It'll all be here. So workers, if you see books scattered all over, just leave them there. And uh, we'll let people um, pick up their books. But write your name in it. Write it on the front. Maybe that way people can see it. And they don't just they don't open that front page. And uh, But... Young people, your decisions, they, they matter so much. Amen. You, you've, got, you've, got, you've got a heart. Look up here, guys. You've got, a, you've got a heart that is ready for God to use you. you. I don't know, some of you might feel like God can't use you, or what would God do with me, and I'm just a kid, or I'm just having fun with life. No, you, you are perfect. You're the perfect one for God to use. And that's why your decisions that can't matter so much. They, they're directing your way. And you get your life directed in a way that's right. And every time you go to a conference, you're preaching once, once more, you're getting a nudge in the right path. And you just keep on doing what God wants you to do. And you, you'll end at your destination. And you'll be so glad you did. You'll get where God wants you to be. And then when you see others who start drifting off and trying to get away from the preaching, uh, those those are the young people you should pray for. Those are the ones that got great, such great potential for God who are pushing away God's will. And we don't want that. So make your decisions. Make them. Talk about them tonight. Get with your youth pastor. Get with your youth worker. Share it with them. Say, I just wanted to share a decision with you so that, that way you can, you can pray for me. And do that. We want you to do that. Wait, don't be ashamed of that. Don't be embarrassed. Now, some of you guys might be, you know, big, strong men, and, and you don't want to share, and that's okay, but, but do it anyway. Now, let us know. No, you don't have to stand up and share it publicly if, if, if you're a little uh, unsure about that, but tell, tell one of us. We want to hear from you, and we want to know what's going on in your life and what we can help, how we can help you. Anyway, thank you for listening so good. We, we have, it's 9.25, head to Kevin's at 10 o'clock. It's 35 minutes. Um, guys, would you like to do something tonight? Some of you have been asking. You would. All right, let me talk to Brother Josh, and um, we'll see see what we can arrange together. And uh, we, we, we may do it tomorrow night, but we'll see. When the siren sounds, though, go to your cabins. It's uh, lights out at 11 o'clock, and I think several of us were up later last night with devotions. Um, workers, if you've got an older cabin, and they're, they're talking, they, they really are sincerely talking, not goofing off. Um, and they're up a little bit after lights out. I don't mind that. As long as it's spiritual, that's okay. Um, but as soon as you're done, got to get lights out. And uh, counselors, young people, counselors need their sleep. They really do. The less sleep they get, the more grumpy they get. And so we want happy counselors. Let them sleep, okay? And uh, they bless you. Lights are on outside. You can play in about 30 minutes. Uh, if you want to practice for a special, you have a special scene. Talk to Brother Trent. Trent, they'll arrange that. And uh, have a good night. Thank you. If you would like, there are ice cream sandwiches in the kitchen. Just for you. Just for you. Fat boys in the kitchen. There are several hundred fat boys in the kitchen just for you fat boys are a type of ice cream